Are you tired of your valuable ideas and suggestions getting lost in the shuffle? Well, that is why I'm introducing Direct Suggest, the revolutionary digital suggestion box that puts your voice front and center. With Direct Suggest, you have the power to make a difference in your organization. Direct Suggest provides value to organizations in various industries worldwide, including notable brands like Comcast, TD Bank, and Nokia. And here's the best part. Direct Suggest only costs 50 cents per employee per month, making it an affordable solution for businesses of all sizes. Plus, they have an incredibly high ROI and savings potential with an average 33 times return on investment. The implementation process is also a breeze. Once committed, setting up Direct Suggest from start to finish can be completed in as quickly as a week or less. Don't let your ideas or your team's ideas go unnoticed. Visit directsuggest.com today and start by making a difference with Direct Suggest. Use the promo code HUMANHR for your extended 60-day free trial. Again, visit directsuggest.com to learn more and remember to use promo code HUMANHR for an extended free trial. Direct Suggest, where your voice matters. Welcome to the Bringing the Human Back to Human Resources podcast. I'm Tracy Chernoff, and I've spent my entire professional career in HR. Each week, we'll explore the delicate balance between people and business with the aim to reconnect the two and create meaningful outcomes. Listen in as I share my own experiences, challenge the status quo, and chat with guests from various industries about our mission to bring the human back to human resources. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Bringing the Human Back to Human Resources podcast. Thank you so much for being here for another week. I'm super excited about this topic and this guest because actually my guest today is an employment law attorney and the first employment law attorney to ever grace the podcast. So this conversation, I think, is going to be so, so, so valuable for all of you listening. So let me introduce you to Carly Wanos, who is a Florida employment lawyer and founder of the Wanos Law Firm, where she helps businesses and HR professionals engage in preventative steps to boost employee retention, navigate tricky issues under employment laws, which we know happen all the time, and help avoid exposure to wrongful termination lawsuits. Carly has litigated employment cases for over 15 years and has found that many HR professionals and employers need education on employment laws. Because of this, Carly created on-demand employment law trainings and courses for HR and management teams and gives free legal webinars through her social media channels. Carly is also the host of the Employment Experience Podcast, where she shares her insights and interviews guests on leadership, management, and all things employment law and HR. And I was very lucky enough to be a guest on Carly's podcast recently. So Carly, I'm so glad that now you get to be on mine and that we get to talk uh, really pick your brain, but talk all about employment law and how this affects the state of the workforce and the workplace. So thank you so much for joining. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. And it's great to speak with you again. Yes, likewise. Um, so we are just to kind of set the stage, we're going to be talking a lot about harassment and discrimination prevention and just in general harassment and discrimination in the workplace. We'll, of course, navigate to those toxic, those pesky toxic managers that creep up or toxic employees even that creep up sometimes in these situations. But I would love to first start off with an explanation of what harassment is and what discrimination is, because so often I know I'm not alone in this. There are claims from employees or individuals that something is harassment when actually it doesn't meet the definition of harassment. Right. You're exactly right. So um, what when people say, you know, someone's harassing me, someone is discriminating against me, um, you can use that in everyday life. Um, But then there's also the legal definition of discrimination and harassment. And a lot of times it's different. You know, I always say my child says that I'm harassing him when I take his iPad away from him too soon. (laughs) Like, no, that's not the legal standard for harassment. I'm sorry. Um, But the, the key point with discrimination and harassment is that it has to relate to a protected class. Um, And so, you know, that's the gender, a national origin, religion, disability. Um, There's several others. What am I missing here? Um, But they- Age. Age, exactly. So, but they they have to relate to a protected class. And um, very- Broadly speaking, discrimination is essentially treating someone differently because of their protected class. So in in the terms of anything to do with their employment, really. So it's not just firing, but it's hiring, 
um, promoting uh, schedules, um, how much you pay the person, changing their work location, things like that. So anytime mm-hmm. you're going to be singling someone out or treating them differently because of this protected class, um, that can arise to discrimination or harassment. Um, harassment on the other hand, is a very high legal standard. I think a lot of people might be surprised to hear how high the legal standard is. And in going through the case law, there's so many just kind of horrifying fact patterns that um, the court said don't rise to the level of harassing conduct. So, But that's not something I always say for businesses to kind of rest on because anytime that there's inappropriate comments, jokes, touching, things like that, you're going to get sued, even if it doesn't Mm -hmm. rise to that high, high level. So the goal is to be aware of it, um, to train your management team so they know what to look out for, what to do and what not to do, and then get it resolved immediately so it doesn't escalate. Right. No, it makes total sense. And thank you for breaking down the definitions and the understanding there. Um, You know, one thing that I've seen throughout my career is this additive of using bullying in addition to harassment so that in different companies, they'll include harassment, intimidation, intimidation and bullying as one kind of clause in their anti-harassment and anti-discrimination policies. Um, But to your point, there has to be some evidence that the decisions or actions taken are based on, you know, the person's protected class. Now, with that said, if someone doesn't fall within a protected class, although everyone kind of falls under some protected class for the most part, um, but the reason why actions taken against them are not from a harassing or discriminatory place, but an employee says, hey, you know, this is discrimination, this is harassment, this is bullying, et cetera, How do you typically recommend HR leaders or business leaders navigate those conversations so that they are leveraging the facts and the policies while also, you know, seeking to mitigate whatever could come of that type of conversation? Right. So from a legal standpoint, if let's say an employee comes to the HR department and says, I'm being discriminated against and that's it. Uh, because I've defended these lawsuits. That's not legal discrimination because they haven't linked it to a protected class. However, Mm -hmm. that's not, from from the HR perspective standpoint, that's not just what you're looking for. You're not looking to throw up your hands and say, oh, you didn't say it was because you're a female, so we're not going to address it. Because what happens is there's a snowball effect, right? If you have employees who are not feeling heard, Um, properly addressed, if they feel as though they're being singled out, like you said, everybody essentially falls within a protected class at the end of the day. I think there was a a huge jury verdict award recently to a white male who wasn't hired because a company was trying to hire um, African-American females and specifically did not hire this white male because he wasn't an African-American female. So essentially everybody can fit into a protected class at the end of the day. Um, And if you're not addressing the needs of your employees, like I said, there's going to be a snowball effect. They're going to be unhappy and it's going to create some issue down the road. Right, right. You know, I was thinking through your response there and even that anecdote, and it's made me think about the the change in the workforce and how even really looking at these last few years with the um, rise in DE&I roles and focus on how there's representation and how companies are ensuring that there is diversity, not only in the interview process, but at the company, you know, at every level and how there are practices within that process that have to be really mindful and strategic in order to avoid you know, litigation or challenges or issues with compliance kind of relevant to the story that you've just shared, how do, how can companies mitigate those types of risks while also prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout their hiring processes? 
Right. I, I think you need to uh, train your employees essentially on um, bias so that they are aware of it. You can't only hire a certain group of individuals. So whether you, you know, you, you have to hire the most qualified person for the position. So it, it does get a little yeah. bit tricky. You're also trying to strike a certain balance. Look, if you have a department that's filled with white males um, and you terminate the only a female of of the group, there is a potential problem too. So I I think the goal, and again, it's it can be a little bit tricky, is to try to strike a balance. But at the end of the day, especially when you're hiring, you you do need to take a look at the the qualifications and hire the best person, the the most qualified person um, for the job. Super helpful. Navigating away from that a bit and really digging into this concept of prevention and preventing or mitigating harassment and discrimination in the workplace, where does this start? Does it start with the culture that executive leadership drives? Does it start with each individual manager? How can companies, whether they're large, small, private, or public, ensure that there is a culture of anti-harassment and anti-discrimination, and not just a culture of that, but actually you know, a sentiment that that is not tolerated? in the workplace? I think it starts at the top. I think in our last conversation, I think you had a different opinion. So I'm curious to hear what you have to say on that. But I think it starts at the top. I think the CEO, upper level management, C-suite needs to be on board with this and say, look, this is behavior that we're not going to tolerate. Um, Because if it's okay with them or if it's slipping by with them, um, if they are not making it a priority to implement certain steps that need to be in place to prevent these things, it's going to be difficult for the managers and everybody below them um, to believe that it's a, it's a priority as well. And I've seen this happen so many times where there is behavior that's going on, shocking behavior. You would think that you were in a fraternity house. I'm um, like, how can mm-hmm. this go on in a professional setting? But you know, in my particular case, it's because the CEO didn't care or thought it was funny or was joining in on it. Um, so you definitely can't have that type of thing going on. One of the most important things that businesses can have in place is the employee handbook. It's going to start with a written policy and not just having it, but making sure that your employees are aware of it and what it means, right? This is not just a form document that you can just give at the beginning when they're hired or not distribute at all, all because I've seen that happen too. We have an employee handbook, but we never distributed it. Um, Make it available for your employees, refer back to it, and then taking it a step further, I highly recommend training your management team and your employees on the policies. So the do's and don'ts, what to look out for, what is not allowed in the workplace, not tolerated in the workplace, and what employees and managers can do if they see it taking place, right? Don't be an innocent bystander. Speak up, say something, and put a stop to it. Because at the end of the day, if this type of behavior is going on, if you are um, a business owner or the CEO that's only concerned about the bottom line, this is going to affect the the bottom line. People are going to become unhappy at work if there's harassment going on. It's going to decrease morale, which as you know, is going to lead directly to turnover and and lowered productivity. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the policies, number one, need to be in place. It needs to actually be implemented. And then your team needs to be trained on um, how to use it. No, I definitely agree. I think what I probably said the last time we spoke, if I if I were to get this right, is that culture is kind of driven by everyone and that it doesn't necessarily start at the top, although I, I think my opinion on this has changed a little bit because if a culture is not established, it can't be grassroots. Like There has to be an establishing party, which is typically your executive leadership. But I do agree a thousand percent that having a culture against and against harassment and discrimination and retaliation and all of that stuff does start at the top because you can't we can't expect an intern or an employee that is fresh out of college to set the standard for or anyone doesn't matter what age they are to set the standard for what uh, is tolerable in the workplace this has to come from not only HR but also the other business leaders in the organization 
which leads me to another thought here that, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is this idea of training and how we coach and help our managers to understand what is okay, what is not okay, tolerable, intolerable. And I wanted to share a story that is from my past. So there was a situation where um, in a past employer, one of the, there was a manager and a couple employees in a meeting with a customer, with a, a vendor, I should say, and like someone external that it was not employed by us. And the vendor made inappropriate sexualized comments toward the, one of the female employees and the manager didn't say anything in the moment there was no course correction there was no hey let's stop this this is inappropriate and there wasn't really to my not from what I can remember this was a while ago from what I can remember there was no checking in with the employee about how they felt and it kind of came up through the grapevine to me that this other employee basically reported that this you know, type of behavior had happened between a vendor and an existing employee. And of course, there had to be an investigation into it. And because there was a third party involved, we had to get their HR team or whoever it was. I think they had an HR team. We had to get them involved about, you know, all of the standards uh, around, you know, anti-harassment. So with that story, I think my next question then is, Obviously, you know, that is not the right thing to do for a manager. A manager has to act when something like that is happening. But what would you say managers need to do if they are trained? Like, how do they actively participate in uh, mitigating these things, but also addressing them when they see them? Right. So in that situation that you just described, that was an excellent example because the manager was probably so uncomfortable. He or she didn't know Mm -hmm. what to do and didn't know how to handle it. And companies are responsible to protect its employees against not only sexual harassment between the employees, but for third parties as well. So clients, vendors, the company has an obligation to speak up and, and put a stop to it. So managers need to be trained and empowered to, number one, be able to identify. This manager may not have realized that it was a harassing type comment. I don't know. He, he may or he may not. So that's number one, to be able to identify it. Mm-hmm. There are so many times I hear in my practice, it was just a joke. She knew I was joking. Well, It may have been a joke at the time, and she may have known that you were joking at the time, but what happens a couple months later when she's fired? It's no longer a joke, and it's no longer funny, and it turns into a sexual harassment claim. So um, I think managers need to be able to identify and then need to be trained on how to address it, and that's going to depend on obviously the particular situation, who it is, what was said, and the type of relationship with the company. Um, You know, do you say something immediately? Do you call this person after the fact? Um, It needs to be addressed. And then depending upon the severity, an investigation does need to take place. Because like I said, the company has an obligation to protect its employees and and to put a stop to it and make sure that it doesn't continue to happen. Right, right. Yeah, that was a a shocking moment in my experience because I remember thinking, well, this was so obvious. Like, this is Mm -hmm. like what you get in the training materials, like a perfect example of what could be sexual harassment. And I was, there was a part of me that was really shocked that the manager didn't say anything because even if it was like, oh, well, let's not get carried away here. Let's keep it focused on business. Something that even if it is a little bit more of a humor-based approach to kind of just like settle the dust until other things are handled, there still would be something said. And I remember, again, this was a while ago, so the parts that I do remember are a little grainy, but I do remember asking like, you know, what are what is the takeaway here? What, are, what have we learned going forward? Because when a manager tolerates something like that in front of whether it's employees, vendors, doesn't matter, it does send this message throughout the organization, throughout the department, regardless of how big or small, that that is okay. Yes. And that means that it can happen by others, from others. Yes, exactly. You're exactly right. So this is okay. Others start doing it. And then the the negative culture starts to expand. And now you don't have mm-hmm. one person making that kind of inappropriate comment. You have everybody. So this is the kind of thing that I address in my trainings and give different examples so that you can have 
you know, actual practice on what to say and how to say it, depending upon the, the, the situation and who you're in front of. I mean, is it is it ongoing comments that you need to step in and say, hey, wait a second, that's inappropriate. Don't say those types of things and set an example for everybody who's in the room. Or is it a limited comment that you can come back later and address it later, but then let everybody in the department or in the room who heard the comment know that it was inappropriate that it's being dressed and this is not how the company operates. But I think it's right. it's important, like I said, to empower the person to be able to know, um, yes, it's your responsibility and obligation as a manager to, to step up and, and to address it either way. Right. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about as you mentioned what you experience in your practice is this idea of like, you know, some maybe looser cultures, that there are cultures out there, there are organizations, especially in smaller organizations or small businesses, where a lot more goes, a lot more is tolerated than what you would find in, like, I used to work for Target. Not, I mean, that the standard of excellence was so clear, like there, it was not a loose culture. There was no joking about anything that could be perceived as inappropriate. But in other companies that maybe are smaller, that is a different experience. And I'm curious, like, when does a company go from, though, you know, maybe being small and scrappy and these jokes are more easily tolerated because people know the intentions of one another, to then being too large, where then it becomes a negative or a toxic culture that could then have this pervasive, not, to not even just toxicity, but potentially like harassing uh, tolerate, tolerated experience for employees? Like, is there a moment where that is, where that shift is obvious or is it that it shouldn't be accepted regardless of the size of the company and a loose culture already needs to be addressed? Yeah. I don't think it necessarily has to do with the size of the company. Um, there mm. was, I'm, I'm thinking of different examples of very, very big, um, national companies that I could say the name of that you would immediately know. I mean, every, everybody would immediately know who I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Um, and when these individuals that the, the plaintiff, so the employee was a part of the sales team. And when the sales team would get a big sale, they would go around and smack each other on oh the butt. Gosh. Like a locker room. And so this is just what they wow. did and everybody did it and it was hip, hip, hooray. You made a big sale. Well, the one person didn't like it. He didn't want to be touched like that. Um, and he was terminated, which is typically when this when this happens oh. and a lawsuit was filed. So, um, you know, it's not necessarily, I think, due to the size. I think it has to do with um, whether or not the company is, you know, tightening up on their policies, whether or not they have mm -hmm. somebody saying, look, this is appropriate. This is not appropriate. We're here to work. Um, and, and again, from the top down, the message of what, what is acceptable and what, what is not acceptable. They were all in on it. They were all having fun. Um, I don't think anybody, I think a lot of the employees were shocked to hear that there were allegations of sexual harassment that came from that. Um, but again, this is this is after the fact and down the road after everything has taken place. So yeah, does that answer your question? I don't think it has to do with size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it does. It definitely challenges the perception that I have around size of company and that the larger companies are more um, rigid or like tightening in their their policies. But actually, to your point, it, it just has to do with any company focused on tightening their policies, period. Right. And and a lot of times the the larger companies do have tighter policies because they have an HR department, right? They have mm -hmm. somebody in charge who's kind of running the show, um, but some don't. And some companies get big quickly and they don't realize that they need to have an experienced HR professional or department right. um, to, to lay down the, the ground rules here. If your company is remote or hybrid, then you know just how difficult it can be to grow your company's culture beyond a pre-scheduled Zoom happy hour or occasional lunch and learn. Well, this week's sponsor is here to solve that. They're called CultureBot. CultureBot has devised what will likely become the gold standard for growing and blossoming a company culture inside of Slack. 
The app is like a sidekick for any HR or people professional, automating a lot of the mundane tasks you probably are forgetting to do on a daily basis. Things like birthday and work anniversary celebrations, team shout outs and kudos, employee introductions, and remote games. It even has health and wellness tips and conversation starters. If that piques your interest, this will get you even more excited. Today, I'm able to share a special promotion for listeners of the podcast. You can get your first six months of CultureBot for 50% off. Plus, if your team is under 25 employees, CultureBot is free forever. So if you're looking for a way to create a culture of appreciation and drive increased engagement and togetherness across your team, I definitely recommend checking out CultureBot. Go to getculturebot.com slash humanhr. That's getculturebot.com slash humanhr to get the offer. Plus, I've added the link in the show notes, so you can just click right there. Now, let's get back to the podcast. Right, right. I get a lot of comments, messages, DMs, emails from HR leaders more often than not who talk about how they feel they've been retaliated against. Mm. Um, for different reasons. And, you know, we, you kind of mentioned in this more recent story with the sales team that this person was terminated and that, that obviously there's some retaliatory uh, allegations there because they were terminated for whatever reason. Obviously, we're only looking at a five second story, but um, just kind of thinking through that and expanding on some of the comments and the messages that I get even HR professionals sometimes are, can be in the right or the wrong. Like there are HR professionals who have been terminated for harassing behaviors. I've seen it. I've, I've uh, had to terminate an HR person for things like this before. And then there are also HR people who are advocating for other employees, but not necessarily advocating for themselves. So when we think about retaliation and how that ties into harassment, intimidation, discrimination, what is a clear uh, parameter for what constitutes retaliation and how can we educate not only HR leaders, but also managers to ensure that they aren't taking retaliatory action against someone? Mm, okay. That's a good one. So this comes after, you know, you have the harassing conduct, you have an employee who complains about the harassing conduct. And so at that point you have a protected activity. So mm-hmm. I counsel clients and, and provide you know, this type of information in my trainings as well, you have to be aware of what constitutes a protected activity. Because again, a lot of managers just don't know, they're not aware. Um, It's not just a termination um, or or it's not just a a complaint. So it's going to be um, a complaint of discrimination, a complaint of harassment. It's going to be um, a reference to not being paid overtime properly. Um, and so when this is done, the manager needs to be aware. So have the educational training to know that this was a protected activity that this employee has now engaged in, and um, there cannot be any retaliation towards this employee, meaning um, adverse adverse actions. So mm-hmm. don't terminate the employee who complains about not receiving overtime. I've had this happen. An employee filed an EOC charge which is a protected activity. Mm. And the company was like, that's ridiculous. They had blatant lies in this charge, fire them. And they fired them because they filed the EEOC charge, which for a company who is not educated on the employment laws, I can see how possibly that might make sense in their mind. Um, Mm. but you, but you need to know that these types of actions are protected under the law. And once an employee engages in them, they, there can be no, it's not that there can be no adverse action against them, but you need to be careful when taking an adverse action against them. Right. Absolutely. I was thinking about, uh, an experience that I had back in my target days where someone had filed like an OSHA complaint and it was total bogus. But I remember saying to the manager that, we could not like, cause I think the manager kind of similarly was like, all right, we're done with this person. Let's just terminate them. And I was like, whoa, 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 we are not terminating them because of, they leveraged their voice mm-hmm. and filed a complaint, like see this through. If it's false, it's going to come out that way. There's going to be a whole audit and investigation. It's going to be fine. And obviously that's, that's what ended up happening, but it, I'm sure it happens so much more often than we realize that people are just terminated for, you know, leveraging their voice or making a complaint when actually they might 
they they shouldn't be or potentially shouldn't be. And uh, I, I, it looks like you're about to say something, so I'll pause because I had a follow up question to this. No, it's okay. It it comes up a lot too when the employees aren't using the the legal terms, right? So like, let's say they're requesting mm. an, an accommodation under the ADA. A lot of employees aren't going to say, I have a physical or mental impairment. I am requesting an accommodation mm-hmm. under the ADA mm-hmm. to which the manager or HR professional says, oh, this is a protected activity. It comes across in the form of, um, I can't get to work on time because I'm taking medication that makes me sleepy or I'm having this issue, right? So it's a lot of times it's more descriptive and that's how companies get into trouble a lot too because then when they fire the employee because they're not showing up to work on time, the employee says, hey, wait a second, I made a request for a reasonable accommodation, which is a protected activity and you fired me because of it. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that I tell companies to look out for a lot is kind of the, um, the, everyday lingo that employees use in engaging these and in making engaging in these protected activities um, and to be aware of that, right? Things like he's treating me differently, he's singling me out, he doesn't like me because A, B, and C, those could all be mm-hmm. complaints of discrimination and not so obvious to people who don't have the training on that. Yeah, that's such a great point. I'm glad you brought it up because I've spoken about this a few times that HR has to be able to lean into the gray area Mm -hmm. and lead in the gray. And it's not to say that we have to be mind readers, but you have to know when there is a potential red flag and to know when to read into it and to ask the right questions. That's always what I say is that it's, you could ask a million questions, but it could be a million questions that give you no information. And recently I did, uh, a podcast episode on like accommodations and the ADA and, and that so much, and it kind of reiterates what you, or validates what you just said, that so much of that process does come down to asking the right questions. If someone says that they need to sit, t- sit down for 15 minutes every day, the question, the, the response isn't, okay, no problem. The question has to be, is everything okay? How, let's make sure we go through the interactive process so that I can make sure that we fully understand what your needs are. And it might seem like a lot, but knowing when there are those trigger words to just like clue in a little bit further and dig in a little bit further can be make all the difference. And I think that probably comes with experience. I mean, mm-hmm. HR business partners more often than not are the ones dealing with the most employee relations issues unless it's like a one person department and it's an HR generalist or an HR manager dealing with everything. But those employee relations issues, the accommodation uh, process, all of that, the more experience someone has, the better they get at asking the right questions. And yes. it can take some time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I was going to ask related to this is I'll, I'll preface by saying that, you know, on LinkedIn, I'm kind of like a lurker. I like scroll a lot. I read people's posts. I go through the comments. You know, it's just the way I prefer to use LinkedIn if I'm not posting. And recently, and probably in the last few months, of course, we've seen a ton of layoffs. You know, it's unfortunate, but also the market, the job market is still strong, but we are still seeing layoffs. And, you know, I've seen a rise in posts from women who are saying that they are on maternity leave or that they have uh, just went out on maternity leave or just had a baby And they were unfortunately made aware of their layoff through a reduction in force or just a a mass uh, termination. And in the comments, I always see non-HR people writing, this is illegal. You have to like take it up with an attorney. This isn't right. And of course, empathetically, this is a horrible situation. Like no one should get terminated ever, like if they're doing everything right. And we never want to see someone who's on a leave of absence, especially a parental leave, lose their jobs. But there's so much more to that. So could you walk us through, and you kind of touched on this already when you said, well, you know, in terms of the retaliation discussion, that it's not that you can't do anything, but you have to be extra careful and super thoughtful about action. So if someone is on a leave of absence, let's say a medical leave of absence, how can an employer or how should an employer navigate that process if they do have to reduce the workforce? Very, very carefully, <laughs> very carefully. Yeah. Um, the chances of being sued, if especially if it's job protected leave under the FMLA 
or if uh, the person is out on leave under the ADA for for a disability, uh, the chances are of getting sued if you fire this person are extremely, extremely high. Um, so mm-hmm. potential defenses here are that the company made the decision to terminate this person prior to the medical leave or prior to the maternity leave, prior to knowing about the medical or maternity leave. The decision was made ahead of time. It doesn't have anything to do with job protected leave, therefore no liability. That's the argument there. Mm-hmm. Um The other defense that a company can potentially assert is you have to show that the medical leave or the um, the FMLA leave, uh, that the termination had nothing to do with that, meaning the entire department was eliminated or there is some sort of standard or qualitative, uh, quantitative information that you can show um, the reasons why this person would have been terminated anyway, but for the leave, essentially. That's going to be difficult because, of course, on the other side, the employee is going to poke holes in whatever documentation or information you present. Let's say that the termination is being based on um, productivity, they are going to be able to poke holes in that and compare other people who had lower productivity that weren't terminated. And if your uh, levels of productivity are based upon different elements or different things, it's going to be pretty easy for them to poke holes in that. Also, you can't make the argument that there is a lower productivity because they're out on the leave, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So it's to answer your question, how do they navigate that? Very carefully, um, unless there's like, very clear cut documentation. Um, I would typically advise against it, but mm-hmm. it obviously depends on a, a case by case basis. Right. Yeah. That was going to be my next question because in my experience where there has had to be some sort of reduction or, you know, maybe mass layoff, even furloughs, um, especially during COVID, it, it's just something that I didn't want to ever touch with a 10 foot pole. It's like, even if you have all of these justifiable reasons, you know, it's like, why, why not just wait until they're out of this protected leave status? Because it's just, um, it's so, it feels so risky and messy and murky. And it just looks bad. You have to think how it's going to look in front of a jury, right? You fired the the woman who's out on leave trying to care for her baby and now she doesn't have a job and she doesn't have a way to support her her new child. I mean, it just, it's not a good thought. It's like the worst case scenario. Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of people who go out on leave when they're on performance improvement plans or final warnings. Like that happens. You can't necessarily control if they're going out on a medical leave. And actually, this is going to take me into another question for you. But it's just, I totally agree. It's like the optics are poor. Just try to avoid it. That would be, that. that's how I've always approached those things at least. But my question here, um, kind of moving in a different direction is actually, something that I'm sure every HR person listening to this is going to say, thank goodness Tracy's asking this because it happens all the time (laughs) when someone is held accountable and they're given documentation and then all of a sudden they come back with a doctor's note and they go out on a leave of absence. We see this a ton in Mm -hmm. California. California uh, employees are like notorious for this. Not everyone, of course. This is, you know, just it happens much more frequently there because it's much easier uh, it's a much more employee-friendly state, I guess we can say. So what what should HR leaders do when that happens? What should companies think about as they are going through these processes of moving through documentation with someone? And is there ever a point where it's better to separate with someone without documentation rather than going through this long, drawn-out process where then you are accommodating a medical leave that could go on and on and on and on for eternity? Almost eternity. Um, so that's so that's a tricky one. I was actually going to touch on this before. It's kind of the what oh. came first, the chicken or the egg, when we were talking about mm-hmm. retaliation. Um, a lot of it comes up when you're having a performance review and you're saying, um, "Look, you know, your performance is subpar. You really need to improve." And the employee says, "Well." it's not my performance. It's because I am held to higher standards because I'm being singled out. I'm being discriminated against. So it's a little bit of what came first, the chicken or the egg. But in your example, um, you know, I, I always want to see the documentation that you have in place. If there are ongoing performance issues, 
um, for a great period of time, I obviously think that the company is going to be in a better place to terminate as opposed to if you have a 15 year employee who has never had any performance issues and there's just this one blip that they have and then they go out on leave and then you terminate them, that's probably going to look bad too. Mm -hmm. Um, also Mm -hmm. to take into account what, what did they do? Was it something minor, major? How long have they been with the company? Um, how good is the documentation? Is it being disputed? Can you actually prove it? Um, all those things kind of come into play. I think though, when right. you do have an employee who requests, so when, when you're talking about going out on leave, are you talking about, um, like FMLA leave or leave as an accommodation? I've seen, yeah, I've seen, uh, a lot of these like, um, like medical leaves from the, like, uh, stress, stress leave, mm. you know, saying that there's like anxiety, like mental health leave. I saw that a lot with California employees, not as much in other states, but the stress leave was a big one. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I just saw, um, another attorney post something on social Mm. media. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Um, but basically she was saying if, if you need to take leave for childcare, if you're having childcare issues and need to take leave, um, you can take leave under the FMLA and say that you have anxiety. So I thought that that was kind of interesting, Mm. but the the wow. the point is is that um, employees are becoming more and more aware of what their employment rights are. They are right. more and more aware that anxiety and depression are um, considered uh, a serious health condition under the FMLA. That they can mm-hmm. take. Um, I'm sorry, under the under the ADA, that it can be considered a disability under the ADA, and that they can mm-hmm. request um, leave or accommodations because of that. So, and that's tricky, especially when they're saying that their anxiety is caused by something at work. It's so intertwined, right? right? Like, how do you untangle that? And again, my answer is going to be very carefully. Um, they had pr- engaged in a protected activity at that time, so you know, without kind of getting into a whole bunch of facts and and what happened and what happened, um, I would recommend probably going through the interactive process, but make sure that you have your documentation in place and don't start documenting the person just because they're taking the leave, right? If, Mm -hmm. If you don't document anything all along and now all of a sudden they've requested leave and now you're like, the paperwork is coming at them really quick and fast, right? For different performance issues, that's probably going to be a problem too. So, so don't do that. And that goes back to, you just need to be consistent with how you're handling performance issues, um, the culture of the company, how you handle performance issues and, and the consistency. And so if there are ongoing performance issues, hopefully that's going to be well-documented before the person engages in any protected activity in the first place. Right, right. That's super helpful. You know, we me- we talked a lot about like training and how to mitigate some of these things, how managers can be coached and trained to know what to do in situations that might feel a bit gray or not as on the nose. And naturally, anti-harassment training is annual, an annual requirement. I th- I think in most states, I've kind of always just said every state, just because why wouldn't you expect all of your employees to go through anti-harassment training. That's always the the uh, assumption that I make, but I know that not every uh, business believes that, especially if it's not required by law. But what would you say is like the minimum expectation for businesses in anti-harassment training? And is there a, kind of like a best practice that you could recommend so that HR leaders are on a good cadence for new hires and active employees to ensure that their training is up to date and compliant? So again, it really depends on the size of the company and if there are a lot of issues. So I have clients that are constantly, there's constant issues going on. I have other clients that there's just not, you know, they have a good handle on things and there's not as many issues and tensions in the workplace. Um, I think at a minimum for new hires, New hires should should um, participate in the training because they're new to the company. They don't know what the company stands for. They may not have been trained in the past at their prior employers. Um, and then once a year. I think once a year it's really important um, for refresher purposes. There are changes to the law. There are different – I think um, something that's um, – really helpful in these types of training is to give real world examples and to kind of act out um, how things happen and how uh, the manager is supposed to respond in certain 
situations. I don't think it's helpful to get up there and to repeat the law or cite to case law because mm-hmm. nobody you know, can pay attention to that. It's dry. It's boring. Um, yeah. But to give those real world examples, because some of these things are quite surprising. They never would have realized it. It's eye-opening for them. And I can see at the trainings, you know, that's like the light bulb moment when they're like, oh, wow, I've been doing that all along. I didn't realize. I Mm -hmm. didn't know. I had no idea. Um, So yeah, I think that that would be good once at the outset and then once a year annually. Perfect. And I think my final question for you here today, and I so appreciate that you have helped us navigate so, a plethora of topics within this one large uh, subject matter. But the, the final question that I have for you here is if you, with your clients that you've worked with, if you have seen a difference in potential harassment claims or even uh, employee relations issues with employers that have gone remote, is there any inclination that remote work reduces the uh, potential for harassment and discrimination? Is there no difference? Is it just that it's the same, but in a different environment? Like what have you seen, if, that, if anything? So I've read a couple articles and this was a couple years ago at the beginning of the pandemic when everybody was starting to work remote, that remote work actually increases the instances of discrimination and sexual harassment claims. And the oh, reason wow. for that is because people are behind a keyboard, they're typing, they're texting, which is more informal. And so when you're doing things like that, you know, um, messaging, I was going to say is instant messenger, but that's not what it's <laughs> called and they don't have that anymore. Um, but but the, the messaging, you know, it's more informal. People feel like they can say those kind of cutesy things that they think are cutesy, but clearly inappropriate. Um, Again, I was just I was just joking. We were text messaging. Messaging. It's almost like they think they're texting with a friend or a buddy. It's less formal, and people say things. I I think easier easier <laughs> through text message and when they're behind a screen than when you're face to face, right? So somebody can say something that they wouldn't necessarily say to your face, and that's why a lot of these things. Um, I, according to the article, were happening more and more because of of the remote nature. Also, wow. at the beginning of the pandemic, people weren't, you know, when when everybody started using Zoom, they were sitting in their bedroom. They weren't using the um, background, and so you felt like you were kind of um, more the the privacy was removed a little bit. It's like so more intimate, almost more intimate, yeah. right? So that's that's another reason I think why the article that I read cited that the, the claims had increased. Hopefully that's gone down by now because we've been doing yeah. this uh, remote work and, and Zoom for a while now, but it was very interesting. Yeah. It makes me think about how much more important it is for HR leaders to have a pulse on what's going on and to really be front and center and approachable. Because if someone, if it is a remote environment and someone is experiencing some sort of harassment, discrimination, um, retaliation, et cetera, that they have to feel like they can report it, even, you know, whether that's creating a, an anonymous hotline or having like a, you know, an email an alias that people can then write to. Because there is, of course, that that fear of retaliation when people are, you know, kind of uh, confronted with a situation that they feel they should report, but often or potentially do not report. So it's, I think, what we've seen in terms of like this rise of having more HR leaders, at least at the beginning of COVID, we're now seeing a little bit of a decline. Like there are different roles out there. I think some businesses are not necessarily putting the same level of uh, value on HR as they did when they needed some uh, health and safety, uh, you know, task forces during COVID. But actually there, there's so much importance regardless of whether you're remote or not, or dealing with a global pandemic or not, because there has to be someone who is the, you know, like in the business expert on how to deal with these things and how to mitigate them. So that's super helpful. Exactly. And then one step farther to actually to, to have the systems in place so they feel comfortable reporting. And then for the HR department or whoever it is to actually do something about it, because I've seen so many times where employees are like, well, I didn't say anything because nothing was going to be done. And that's, um, Mm -hmm. you know, that's worse. That's worse, right? That shouldn't be the, Mm -hmm. the um, perception that they have. So 
Absolutely. Well, Carly, thank you so much for all of your knowledge and expertise on this subject and all of the things that we talked about today. Um, For everyone listening, a reminder, please make sure you subscribe and download Carly's podcast, The Employment Experience Podcast. The Employment Experience Podcast will be linked in the show notes so you can get connected. But other than that, Carly, where can everyone find you? And of course, I'll make sure all of your links are linked in the show notes as well. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I post a lot on social media. I am on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. So you can find me there. I would love to connect with you as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. Hey, just before you go, don't forget to subscribe to the show so that you are the first to hear when an episode drops each week. And maybe leave a five-star review and a comment about how much you loved this episode. Plus, if you have someone in mind who would really enjoy this episode, make sure you share it with them. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next week.